Hello and welcome to our new series in which we review cameras, lenses and various other kit in association with our partners Camera Kit. My name is Gareth and I'm Paul and we're going to start off today by looking at a piece of kit that has become very popular in the cinema and in the corporate video space. That is of course the Blackmagic pocket cinema camera. I come from the world of corporate videography and I also direct and shoot music videos and I've used this little camera almost exclusively personally for all my projects for the past year or so. I've owned it almost exactly a year at this point and I've used it both on its own as an A-cam and also as a arguably A-cam alongside Sony FS7, GH5 and cameras in the Canon range. I've used it both here in Ireland in the United States and in Europe, and it has served me incredibly well. So Paul, you got your camera about a year ago too. Yeah, so I'm, I'm coming from the audio uh, side of things. So I used to do uh, videos as well, small bits and pieces on uh, DSLR. So I jumped from basic DSLR and with stock everything to the black magic. Um, and I've been using it well on corporate events, live music videos, uh, festivals, all this stuff. And the jump from that, um, was daunting at the start but once you get your head around it like all the color grading the software that comes with it different packages and all that kind of stuff it was um it's a little bit tricky but once you get your head around it, it was actually it was good black magic pocket cinema camera 4k and now with the 6k older brother both kind of awkwardly named but the name is actually accurate it is a cinema camera and while it might resemble a dslr or dslm camera like the sony a7 cameras like the gh5 or like the canon or series cameras this is a fundamentally different camera in many many ways and what that means is it shares many of the positives and negatives of a cinema camera so all of the little luxuries that you might be used to in your dslr camera are not present you don't have a flip out screen you have poor battery life you don't have internal image stabilization and you have on the other hand a huge amount of control over the image that won't be present in a standard dslr everything from false color in the menu to shooting raw in body without any other accessories other than storage media and of course an image which is 12 bit which is something that i don't think you can find in any other camera at this size or price range so we're going to talk a little bit about how we personally use the camera and how we rig it up and this is a camera that requires a lot of external add-ons and um, both during production and afterwards so Paul how do you mm. use your camera and um, so at the start I just had a body and um, ended up getting a cage I got all the bits and pieces that were on that the SSD holder the grip um, got a monitor then for the top and um, so I was using that for a long time um, which was great because you could just be kind of like you know you weren't running around with this big massive rig um, and it was really subtle really nice um, and then I just found myself just having to edit a lot and work on the because there's no Im image stabilization within it I ended up getting the Moza Air 2 uh, gimbal um, which I found really really su super easy to use you once you calibrate it you're ready to go um, and I found that, that was it was still nice and slim um, heavy you need to you know take that into consideration as well i hadn't got v-mount batteries or anything like that so i'm using internal batteries um and other than that it was great to use i came from shooting primarily with gimbal um on my old panasonic camera which was a very light actually the panasonic g80 which is the little brother of the gh5 i had that on a crane too and it was an incredibly light running gun setup, which mm. let me do lots of cinematic crane shots, lots of smooth rotating shots around people mm -hmm. for say corporate shoots where you'd have crowds chatting or uh, even even during interviews to get like B-roll of, uh, of someone without setting up a slider. Yeah. Uh, it has a huge amount of flexibility. And obviously for music videos, you can do push-ins, you can mm -hmm. do all sorts of like three-dimensional movement where you're moving on one axis as you're lifting the camera, all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So that's what I wanted out of this camera. It's actually one of the reasons why I got it over something like say a C100. But what I realized uh, pretty quickly when I got the camera was certainly with my old gimbal, it really, really couldn't handle the weight of the camera and the lenses I wanted yeah, to use on it. So we don't have it on display here because we're actually we're actually shooting with it. Mm. But the uh, the lens that I use on the camera is the Sigma eighteen to thirty five. So what I needed was a very, very strong gimbal that could take a very front heavy lens. Ideally, I wouldn't need to add on counterweights like you might with the Ronin. Mm. Could run all day and wouldn't have that thing where it can flake out and start you know 
flying all over the place, yeah, which yeah. can happen with gimbals. So I invested in the Crane 3. It was very expensive at the time. I think it was about a thousand euro when I purchased it, uh, but it has served me very well. So what it lets me do is, as you can kind of see it set up right here um, on the gimbal, um, there's no counterweight at all. Uh, I can put on the 18 to 35. I think we have a Canon 24 to 105 on here right now, but mm -hmm. the 18 to 35, which is longer and heavier, I can have my SSD rolling right in to the side of the camera there. And I can do all of the things that you would do with a gimbal, all of the motion tracking shots. I think I can put it in follow mode. I can turn softly and it, by and large, if I understand the limitations of the gimbal and um, with it with a heavy camera on it, it will work. So that's what I focused on. And as time went on, I got filters. I've also got the Promist, uh, Tiffin Promist filter, and I have a variable ND. So obviously, mm. this is another thing that you need to be aware of with this camera. Unlike a lot of other cinema cameras, it doesn't have an ND filter built in. Yeah, there. yeah, you do. You do have to build a lot of it up, and um, which at at the start I didn't know because. I was getting into these cinema cameras and even just upgrading into a, a better camera. Um, and then I soon realized that, oh, I have to spend a lot more um, to get where I want to, to be in terms of rigs. Um, so the gear, like, I mean, I was willing to spend because I, I was upgrading anyway. Um, and the gear that I've got, is, I'm super happy with it. I will be happy to say that the color is as good as any camera I've ever seen. It's a micro four thirds, uh, a sensor so it's not going to be as sharp as a full frame or even a super 35 uh, um, sensor especially as you're going to go through an adapter if you're using a canon lens like this or a sigma lens say you're probably going to be using mm -hmm. either a viltrox or a metabones adapter to get that wider super 35 field of view and get the bigger lenses on and they will result, result in a small diminishment of sharpness mm. but if you're sh shooting short films you're shooting music videos and even if you're shooting corporate b-roll you don't necessarily want to be razor sharp yeah, you yeah. want that more cinematic feel and the natural feel and i feel like the flexibility i have with color on this camera once you do add in all the accessories it's just incredible mm. it can look so good and it can look like other cameras and it's quite easy to match to other cameras yeah, too yeah and it's super in, in low light and um, especially with the um adapters uh, like the vtrox and the metabones it gives you that one stop extra um of light which is great because on on this it's a you know f4 and then it drops it down to a three point a two point eight so um yeah that's an extra bonus yeah and on my that. sigma it's it's 1.8 which is already very yeah. fast last and it drops it right the way down to 1.2 mm. which I, I usually leave it a little bit um maybe 1.4 a mm. little bit less open than that because i just want to retain a bit more sharpness but at 1.4 it's you know it's usable it's yeah. sharp and it's you know you can shoot at night under moonlight uh at one yeah. point at 1.4 and when you go up to 3200 on this and i would say that the camera is really usable for for corporate work for high-end movies i'd say up to like 1600 maybe um, and then 32 is there if you need it. Yeah. You're not going to get a lot of noise, but you will get a lot of smudging. And I've found, well, I do a lot of editing as well. When you edit Canon footage or, or Sony footage, and Sony have a great reputation as low light cameras, but there's a sort of fixed pattern noise that you'll see in okay. low light shots. So let's say the camera might be up at its maximum ISO or not, but there's not enough light in the scene. What you'll see in the shadows is a lot of electronic looking noise, not just sparkles, yeah, yeah. But especially on the Canon, lines that run through the image. You don't see that on this camera. The small amount of denoising that they do in camera, you're not going to have any issue with noise as long as you have a good light source at mm. any ISO from you know 100 to 3200. Yeah, and even at that, it's like the, you, the ISO, the dual ISO on this is like you know if you if you haven't got a good light source or but you still want to capture something that you don't want to miss, you'll still pull it off. This camera is renowned for its ability to shoot raw. They've invented a new format for this camera and for the Ursa line. It's called Blackmagic Raw. Now, there's a little bit of contention about this because some people will argue that any camera that does what's called debayering, that's taking the RGB uh, pixels inside of the camera and doing some color processing to produce it, an image, that that's not truly raw, that a real raw image will come out with none of that done. But at the end of the day, the flexibility that you get in raw is partly because you can change um, white balance. And in the case of Blackmagic Raw, you can also change ISO. And what that gives you in terms of flexibility as a shooter is something that I don't think has been talked about enough. It literally means that I can go out and shoot in bright light and I can move between dark and shade. And I know that if I shoot at, let's say 400, and I have my ND set up for that, that if it does peak, if it goes and blows out someone's face yeah. or something, I can change in post, I can cut a new clip out of my clip that I've been shooting, change just that clip to 100 
and have the full dynamic range there that it, that image won't be clipped. And even above and beyond that, because these are really, really fat data heavy codecs, it can also pull back a lot of those highlights. Yeah, so yeah. even if it does at that, at 100, push a little bit outside the image, you can. there's actually an option to add a little bit of extra image recovery and you can pull down and you often find that there is something to recover there in the highlights. So in that regard, it's a it's a lifesaver. You know, com coming from the audio side of things, it's it's like almost recording, uh, you know, thirty two bit. That you know you can you have so much headroom, um, that if you 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 mess up a shot and it's blown out because you hadn't got time to change your settings, that you can do that in post now. And for me, that was really good because I didn't, you know, have to be spot on all of the time. That you can make little mistakes and stuff like that so i i thought from having that raw it was it was brilliant like and the other thing to mention is that the raw in this is not like canon raw or canon raw light say where you're going to need a monstrously powerful machine to yeah. use raw this is compressed raw you can have it down to uh, three to one compression or up to eight five to one uh, 12 to 1 and they, they also have constant quality and constant bit rate options mm -hmm. i usually use honestly on corporate shoots 8 to 1 or 12 to 1 no problem at all very clean image very high quality image more importantly it's an image that i can i can edit mm. 4k 60 frames a second with no lag no slowdown scrub a timeline with four five six channels no issue at all whereas even on my computer which is a fairly recent build mm. with 32 gigs ram and a good i7 processor I would struggle to edit um, Canon RAW or Canon RAW Lite. Yeah. It really is very heavy and you'd nearly uh, need to use proxies or transcode, yeah. which kind of takes away some of the point of having RAW. Because exactly, you're yeah. making those decisions too early or you're forced to have a multi-stage editing process. None of that's true with this. Yeah. You can throw it in. It's now supported in Premiere. Not in Final Cut, but DaVinci Resolve and Premiere both natively support it. Mm -hmm. And presumably, hopefully Final Cut will in the future. But I, I couldn't be happier with that as a format. <laughs> Coming from a basic DSLR for me, um, using this operating system and menu was like second to none. It was so easy to use. I understood everything um, from getting into recording, the audio, the preamps um, are really good on it as well. Uh, we've got mini XLR, you know, uh, the whole operating system for me was so easy. I got to know the camera really well in the space of like two days. Um, and understanding little shortcuts and the F1 buttons and, you know, customizing everything, putting my LUTs on it. I've used Canon cameras for a long time, used Panasonic cameras, and I've used Sony FS7 cameras, which are kind of industry standard for corporate work. Mm. And my goodness, some of those menus, especially on the Sonys, can be extremely difficult, not just for novice users, but even for experienced users to yeah. come in and set up a camera. It a small change in the menu can do something, let's say changing from a log profile to a different log profile, it might not be easily noticed, which can have a dramatic impact on image quality. Yeah. There's nothing like that on this camera. It, it is very much WYSIWYG, it's this beautiful clear screen. Mm -hmm. So whatever you're changing, whether you're changing a lot, you're previewing something, you see it straight away. And um, you can scrub footage in real yeah. time on the screen when you're playing back, yeah. which is amazing. Even slow motion footage is conformed in camera so it's already yeah. slow um, and of course the buttons are fantastic too something that people didn't really say when the camera came out is that you have a s series of buttons here on the front which set ISO uh, white balance and shutter speed and they work in conjunction with a little wheel so with a single touch you can go change your white balance, change your shutter speed. That's something that you'd be familiar with from say Panasonic cameras. Yeah. But there was a lot said about the menu. Maybe the touchscreen isn't so easy. Anything you're gonna need on a shoot in real time to change, you can change with the buttons. There's also three uh, function buttons, as Paul yeah. mentioned. I have them set up for uh, LUT preview, for um, uh, false color, which is excellent. And you can set them up in any way you want. Any function on the camera can, can be mapped to those buttons. So really, even with just the hardware buttons, you also have a dedicated high frame rate button for slow motion, yeah. just like S&Q, say, on a, on, a, on a Sony camera. So there, there's really all the control you'd like, and the deeper control is there in the menu. And they have custom profiles, which is amazing. When I first got my monitor, um, even at that, it was like, you know, you can mirror image everything you're using on your screen. You still touch your screen, you see everything on the monitor. And it was just flawless from that point. From my point of view, coming from the audio and the small, you know, background of DSLRs, this was just like a game changer. But then on the other hand, you have the cons, which is like, battery life you know uh, you have to build a rig you have to get you know speed boosters all this kind of stuff 
you know storage on this is you need big storage and um, which yes. is great because we have the ssd this is a camera that requires a lot of storage and as you can see we've got a, an ssd one of the samsung t5 ssds hooked up to it that is how i shoot now it, it's a little bit wobbly i don't mm. like having this usb 3 cable running outside of a camera mm. come rain winter shine at the same time it is a very cheap way of storing i have a one terabyte i have, actually have two of them and that'll get me through any kind of day and any kind of quality that yeah. i want and, and, and maybe even a whole series of days depending on how i want to shoot but uh, i know i'm safe that i can do that and I don't need the expense of a CFast card. That said, the camera can also shoot on CFast cards if you want to do all of the full range of, uh, of codecs and, and quality levels. And if you're happier to shoot at, say, 1080 or maybe at a push uh, at, at 4K using a lower quality setting, you can use SD cards as well. When I first got it, I, I used the, done a test on a micro SD card, uh, which is a fast enough card, but it still shot to a micro SD card, which was amazing. Um, Having said that, it was only HD proc using proxies. But, it, you know, worst case scenario, your hard drive goes or whatever, and you have a little micro SD there that's fast enough to do HD, you can get away with a micro SD card as well. Not saying that you should be using it, you should be using the shooting 4K. The good thing about the SSD, the T5s, you know, recording directly to them, I found that I just plug it into the laptop or whatever I'm editing on, and you're, you're not transferring files. You're not waiting for them big chunky 4k files to go to another hard drive to, in order to edit your you plug it in you start editing mm. it reads straight away like and we haven't mentioned i mean this is a camera that doesn't only shoot in blackmagic's raw format it also shoots prores which is mm. industry standard for uh tv productions uh, certainly drama um for music videos and for uh, really any editing house in the world can edit prores and any editing package will support it so if uh, anyone you're shooting for is uncomfortable with the blackmagic raw you can shoot prores it's 10 bit rather than 12 bit but 12, 10 bit is still fantastic yeah. the image quality is is excellent in that format as well and of course the files can potentially be smaller depending on uh, exactly your quality settings but certainly there is a as you mentioned prores uh, uh, what's it called prores preview or prores uh, prores proxy, proxy. Yeah. and which is quite a small uh, file size indeed and on this camera the quality is, is you know still fantastic yeah. so for me i use the lp6 stock batteries um you know i've used i've done actually done a test uh, and i got 47 minutes using hd and proxies and after that the camera just shut off Actually, it, it stored all the footage before it. I didn't lose any footage, and that was straight to the micro SD card. Um, so I, I use a LPE sixes. I had to buy loads of them, so they're fine. That's why I, I power this. And sometimes off the gimbal as well, I can power directly off the gimbal that I use, um, which is the Mosa Air Two. When I first got the camera, you know, I was getting with the internal battery maybe thirty minutes, and that's thirty minutes screen on time. Mm. Um, not really didn't really matter whether it was recording or not and that's terrifying to me as you know corporate shooter mm. it needs to work and I, I, I couldn't really be spending the kind of money that it would have taken to get I think LP E6 batteries are maybe between something like 50 and 80 yeah. euro in that in that range so you know needing 10 of them we're talking 700 euro at the time it's nothing I could spend so what I did instead was I got these Sony NPF batteries um, and I, on uh, two adapters so one rides on the gimbal all the time and it runs into a false battery which sits inside the camera and I've removed the little battery cover and um, I have maybe 10 of these because I also use them for lights and mm -hmm. for various other things and I find they vary um, these are very, very cheap ones that came with a light. I also have slightly more expensive ones and I have larger ones too of various capacities. Um, the negative is you don't really know how long they're going to last. So once they get down to around 30% or they start flashing or anything like that, yeah, I'm immediately changing, changing them. And the other downside is that because you're using the false battery, you don't have a backup battery. So you can get adapters. They're more expensive though, which run straight into the power adapter that you'd normally use for your wall socket uh, to power the, the camera, which does come with the camera. You get a plug for the wall. Um, and those will let you change battery let's say you're recording a gig or something like that yeah. without having to um, turn off the camera because you keep going on the internal battery. Um, can't do that with these, but I will say I get, depending on the individual battery, could be an hour, hour and a half, maybe an hour and 45 from each battery. So I can get through a full day pretty pretty handily with you know maybe five or six of these batteries. 
I'm not downplaying it that that is a ridiculous amount of batteries to have to have even with yeah. giant batteries and they are an extra thing so when I'm riding them on the camera handheld I'll have an adapter uh, on top so it's an additional bulk and it is one more thing that gets in the way of you know run run to the park with the camera or something like that yeah. um, but you know it is a good way to go and short of the V-mount battery V-mounts are yeah. amazing they, they, they're fantastic they power light and lots of cinema cameras but they're very expensive and mm -hmm. a V-mount battery and a separate V-mount charger is going to set you back maybe the guts of a grand, you know, maybe maybe a little bit less depending on the size of the battery, but the charger alone will be hundreds of euros. So yeah. short of a VMM battery, which of course you won't be able to use a gimbal, probably exactly. for me, these are the best way to go. And they're, they're readily available at various price points. Obviously the, the more expensive official Sony MPF batteries yeah. will last longer and be more reliable and charge faster too. So, you know, keep that in mind. But there's lots of ways to, to power this camera. There, there are dedicated V-mounts that are built to go onto the camera, especially if you're um, using it handheld. And there are uh, batteries that fit in cages. Um, mm. Tilt, I know, makes a battery attachment. There are really, it's such a popular camera, there's numerous ways to power it. Yeah. But it is something you need to think about before you get the camera. Yeah, yeah definitely think about what way you're going to power your camera and what kind of setup works for you. And um, that's what I found, like, now my, my setup I have LPE6s, it works for me, so I'm just going to continue using the LPE6s. Uh, but yeah, definitely think about um, what way you're going to power the camera. Okay, Paul, so coming from this, a sound engineer and sound recordist background, can you tell me what makes this camera different in terms of how you can record sound? Um, yeah, well, straight off, it's like for me, it was the XLR. Being able to put an XLR um, input into this was one of the best things ever because it gives me the choice and chance to use all the nice mics that I have in the studio. Um, the preamp within it is actually really nice. Um, you've got a 3.1 input as well that you can record lav mics. Um, we've got uh, the OS. We've got so much... Uh, ability to change our inputs, our level inputs, line inputs, mono inputs. Um, so it's you know it's it's great for audio straight away. Yeah, and you can you can uh, as Paul said, you can change your inputs in, in the menu system, mm -hmm. meaning that you can say uh, use the left channel for my lav mic, use the right channel for my XLR mic, mm. or you can say record scratch audio with the inbuilt, there's four mics I think for for really I think compared to any DSLR I've used amazing audio mm -hmm. in in body. That can be your backup audio while you're recording in with the mic, maybe one that you haven't used before, or you're, you just want to have something just to make sure that if the talent's mic goes and you're focused on the image, that you're getting good sound or some yeah. sound. Like uh, definitely the the internal uh, mics in this, they're not they're a little noisy for me, um, but yeah, I would only use them for scratch. Um, but other than that, like the the, the preamp on the mm -hmm. um, XLR is really good. Whereas I'd say like you know in a pinch. I've done some dock recording where we didn't have a mic. It was kind of last minute and I've used the internal mics and the only negative I found was that wind resistance. Yeah. So yeah, so yeah going outside, you're going to hear wind. But again, it is not like on a Canon. Uh, there's no like noise floor that's going to intrude on dialogue. It might not be, you know, what a sound engineer yeah. would be happy with, but it, it would certainly fly for, you know, a contingency recording in a live situation. And it's very readily understandable for voices yeah. and, you know, very rounded sound. Obviously, it's not as good as a dedicated mic, but for yeah. internal in a camera, I don't think there's better. Getting to kind of overall cost of ownership, it really is important to remember that, as we said at the start, this is a cinema camera. Yeah. You, you're not going to be taking it out of the, the box and shooting straight away, except in a, in a more limited way than you might be with a smaller camera. And what I mean by that is you need things that go with it. So you can see on here, I've got a cage. This is the small rig cage. The tilted cage is generally, I think, regarded as, a, as a, also a very good cage. I haven't used that though. Um, what small rig cage lets you do is put on things like a, an attachment for the storage, the external storage, hot shoes for microphones or, or other um, things that you might want to connect to it. And um, you're also obviously going to need storage so that I would strongly recommend for 4K, either CFast card or an external hard drive. If you want to use Canon Glass, which is very popular in Ireland, mm -hmm. very cheap secondhand, you're going to want an adapter either from Viltrox or Metabones, although they're increasingly uh, reasonably priced as time goes on. Um, you're also going to need storage space externally for that footage. Yeah. So like, I, as I mentioned, I've been doing this corporate shooting and, and, and music video shooting for about a year with the camera, and I, I have five, six terabyte uh, G drives which are mm. they're fast spinning drives that you can edit 4K footage directly from. So that's, you know, 30 terabytes of storage for one year. And that's not retaining every project. That's just all my own projects and all the projects where I'm like, they might come back and need that footage. Mm. Not not everything. And they're almost all full. So that's, that's a, that is a 
that's not inconsiderate mm. amount of money. Um, uh, but I do, you know, the flexibility in post, as I mentioned in raw, I think it justifies it. What, what about yourself? What 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 have you laid laid down? Oh, it's um yeah, the same again. I built up the rig using the sm small rig uh, cage, handle, SSD holder. You know, batteries was a big thing for me. Um, then I had some uh, Canon glass already, so I had to go for the uh, Viltrux uh, speed booster. Um, you know, I got a the Mosair two uh, batteries already. Um, yeah, so it's it's a little expensive out of the box, um, but yeah, you just have to. It's it's like your toolbox, you know. You never stop adding to it. So as this is a retrospective review, I thought I'd really quickly mention some of the changes that have been made since release. This camera runs on what's called a fully programmable GPU, an FP GPU, which means that the camera can be changed much more fundamentally with new codecs than many cameras which have dedicated hardware like your standard DSRs can be. So Blackmagic have really changed how it works quite a bit. The biggest change being at the beginning when they added Blackmagic RAW support and took away Cinema DNG. Now, some people might have had an issue with that since Cinema DNG did give a higher quality of image. Cinema DNG is just literally where you have a series of photographs mm -hmm. in a folder and that's your RAW picture. So each one is a still frame, whether at full quality or slightly compressed. But what it also did was make it much easier to use the raw footage. Cinema DNG needed, you needed a very powerful computer to edit that footage. Um, so it, that was a bit of a change for the positive or the negative, but either way, it made it more usable. Mm -hmm. They've also added since then um, uh, firmware updates, which increase the battery life slightly, which um, allow you to use uh, push to focus on more lenses. So my, I noticed recently with the latest firm update, my Sigma has push to focus again. If you're not familiar with that, that's autofocus is not really, doesn't really work with this camera. But push to focus, where you have a subject in frame and you wanna make sure it's in focus, you push the button, the camera will find that focus. That works pretty well right, right now. Um, what they've also added is 75 frames per second, 4K slow motion and widescreen, which is frankly, again, unmatched in a DSLR. Yes, there are DSLRs which offer 120 frames a second slow-mo, but it's either windowed, pushed in on the sensor, yeah. it's in um, full HD rather than 4K, um, or it doesn't look good. And I would say that the slow motion in this um, looks effectively just as good as the, um, as the regular speed footage. This is not a camera that I would recommend to everyone. Um, if you're a vlogger, it doesn't have a flip screen. That's a huge issue. And you know, it's it's probably more camera than you need and certainly more hassle than you need in editing. If you're a um, a travel uh, filmmaker of, of many kinds, maybe not necessarily ideal. It's a lot of gear to bring with you through an airport, especially in terms of batteries. There's also the hassles associated with that. Um, if you are running gunning, shooting your family on the weekend, messing around, you want something to carry to the park, absolutely not. This is too big physically and too awkward and the battery life issue, no. Mm -hmm. Who I would say it's absolutely for. Wedding filmmakers, fantastic. If you're happy, if you can find a, a solution, whether it be these kind of Sony batteries or a, a V-Lock um, battery or a gold mount battery or, or even just the internal batteries, if you're okay to shoot in bursts, 100%. The color you will get, the image, the couples will be incredibly happy. Music videos, you wanna do a lot of post editing. I remember I would struggle with trying to color grade footage from my Panasonic camera, which was 8-bit, this is 12-bit. You can make this look like anything. If you put in the time, you can use things like Film Convert. Mm -hmm. It's gonna look fantastic. So for a music video where you're putting in loads of time for a short film, brilliant. Mm -hmm. Short films, absolutely fantastic. Yeah. You know, this is not a camera that like, say like many RED cameras needs loads of light or looks great in natural light, but doesn't look good in artificial light. It looks good in mixed light. It looks good in artificial light in, in tungsten um, or fluorescent, and it looks fantastic in natural light. So any kind of film setup where you don't have a huge budget, yeah. brilliant. Before we finish up, I, I should mention a few little niggles that I had personally with the camera. Um, like I say, I, I could not be more happy with it, but there are some things that make it odd or less than ideal. One thing is that you cannot delete footage from the camera at all. You have to go to a computer. It doesn't matter whether you're using SD, uh, CFast or SSD. The footage, once you record it, is stuck there until you delete it on a computer, which is odd. I've never encountered that with a camera before. 
it's not a huge problem for me because I, again I use these SSDs but it, it's a weird niggle. Secondly um, and I should say this I'm incredibly happy with the strength of the body it seems like a flimsy camera it's got this um, polycarbonate uh, shell it's not magnesium or something like this but it's actually very strong and I, I'm really happy with that I was kind of worried about it so it has the camera has vents uh, here at the front which it uses because uh, it's got a really powerful graphics card essentially inside it so it uses to cool the camera and um, but I was a bit worried about rain and stuff hasn't really been an issue at the same time I wouldn't take this out in the rain I really wouldn't I would be very worried because it has holes in the front of the camera so weather sealing is out the window similarly I wouldn't be super happy with using it in the desert it's not something that comes up in Ireland but you know that kind of thing I'd be more worried and um, that said no issues I've used it in mist I've used it you know in the early morning uh, and I've taken it around the world and I'm sure it has been around water you know in bags and stuff no problem so far but it is a little bit of a worry and I suppose finally there's the fragility of this external storage solution you know it's great that it takes the external SSDs maybe they could have built some kind of pocket in the camera to take oh, yeah. them internally and I think there are some cameras that are starting to do that now and um, through the external units where they they take an SSD but there is a unit that drops in an SSD limits what you can buy for it but you feel a bit more protected and safe those it would be kind of my few little niggles and I suppose the only other final one would be I do work in the corporate space and the Sony FS7 is seen as more professional and does get you more work that said I would infinitely prefer to use this any day of the week than a Sony FS7 or indeed a Sony Alpha camera or even a Panasonic GH5 for most things although having that flip screen is very handy when you need it but there are you know it, it's not a familiar camera and there are situations where people will be wanting you to use something that isn't this and that's a problem but that's not the camera's fault so you can purchase this camera now from camerakit.ie um, which is a proud partner of this channel and our videos um, which we're doing uh, reviews on gear that we use every day and trying to get the pros and cons of them so yeah camerakit.ie I actually pre-ordered mine um, and I think I was probably the second person in Ireland to get it um, which I actually had to send back uh, because there was a problem with the fan um, and I got one then two weeks later so um, yeah camera kit .ie, you can purchase this and they're actually doing um, all the small rig stuff and it's important to mention that camera kit are still open both for purchases and rentals throughout this COVID-19 epidemic and there's actually tremendous savings to be made in terms of their rental costs I think there's a 75% off deal right now for rentals which is astonishing so you know okay you're limited in how you can shoot but you're not limited with what you can shoot with that kind of saving and the showroom is also uh, available and it's really as far as I know the only kind of walk in both to consumers and prosumers mm -hmm. A showroom dedicated for video hardware in the whole country. You can go in, you can try out the FX9, the new Sony camera, you can try it or have a look at the, the new C500 Mark II camera mm -hmm. uh, and the Canon range and the Sony range, the Ursas, and of course the Blackmagic Pocket 4K and 6K. And I really would strongly recommend uh, the shop staff are incredible to deal with and they've been fantastic with us on numerous yeah. occasions for rentals.